of education and the anthroposophic movement. Because I am coming to the conclusion of this lecture course on education, I would like to express my deep satisfaction with our friends in Holland that our friends in Holland have assumed. Read that again. Because I am coming to the conclusion of this lecture course on education, I would like to express my deep satisfaction that our friends in Holland have assumed the task of nurturing anthroposophy and have taken the initiative to arrange this course. Such enterprises always involve a great deal of hard work for the organizers, and because we have so much to arrange in Dornach, we know very well what goes on behind the scenes of such occasions. There is much work to do which calls for a tremendous effort and energy. So before leaving Holland it is clear that I must express my very warmest thanks to those who have worked together to bring this whole conference to fruition. An educational course has taken place, and in my closing words I may be permitted to say something about the role of the art of education within the whole realm of the anthroposophic movement. An educational art has grown within the anthroposophic movement, not as something that found its way into the movement through abstract intentions, but through necessity and the movement itself. Until now few activities have arisen as naturally and inevitably from the anthroposophic movement as has this art of education. Likewise, as a matter of course, Eurythmy has grown from the anthroposophic movement through Marie Steiner and medicine through Dr. Wegmann. And as with the other two, educational art has, I venture to say, arisen likewise according to destiny. <clears throat> the anthroposophic movement is without doubt an expression that corresponds to human efforts that result from the very fact that humanity has come about on earth. Just recall the ancient times when the various mystery centers cultivated religion, art, and science through spiritual experience. It makes us realize how in those ancient sacred centers human beings conversed with suprasensory beings to bring the life of spirit into outer physical life. We can find our way further into the history of human development and discover again and again the urge to add suprasensory reality to the sensory reality of humankind. These perspectives open when we penetrate the history of human evolution. We see that within anthroposophy today there is ceaseless human effort. Anthroposophy lives out of the longings and endeavors of human souls living today. And it may be said in truth that at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries it became possible for those who have the will to receive revelations from the spirit world and these will again deepen the whole world view of humankind. Today revelations from the spirit world must manifest in a way that differs from the old mystery truths. They must accord with modern science and these are, and these are the essence of anthroposophy. And those who make them their own also know that out of the conditions of today many more people would come to anthroposophy if it weren't for the tremendous amount of biased, preconceived feelings and ideas that block their path. But these things must be overcome. A larger circle of anthroposophists must grow from our small one. <clears throat> and if we imagine everything that lives and works in this group without declaring anthroposophy a religious movement, we may allow a deeply moving picture to arise before us. Imagine the mystery of Golgotha. Only a hundred years later, the most brilliant Roman writer, Tacitus, wrote of Christ as though he were virtually unknown, someone who had met his death over in Asia. At the time, at the height of Roman civilization and culture, people were living the traditions of the previous several thousand years, and even then nothing was known of Christ. <clears throat> it is possible to paint a picture of an important fact with words. There, Above is Roman civilization, the arenas, the brilliant performances, and everything that takes place in Roman society and state government. Below are the underground areas known as the catacombs. Many people are gathered by the graves of those who, like themselves, believed in the mystery of Golgotha. These people must keep everything secret. Their underground activities surface only when a Christian is smeared with pitch and burned in the arena as an entertainment for the civilized citizens. We have two worlds. Above is the life of Roman civilization based on their ancient resplendent traditions. Below is a life developing secretly beneath the earth. Let us consider the brilliant writer of this period, 
He wrote what amounts to no more than a passing reference in his notes on the birth of Christianity, while his desk in Rome may have stood over the catacombs, and he had no idea of what was taking place beneath him. Several hundred years later, what had spread in such a spectacular way had disappeared. The Christian civilization has surfaced, and Christianity is expanding in Europe, where there had been Roman culture before. Keeping this picture in view, we see the actual process of human evolution. Often when people contemplate the present time, they are inclined to say that certain anthroposophists do not hide under the earth today. This is no longer the custom, nor would they have to do so. In an outward sense, anthroposophists find themselves in surroundings as beautiful as any. But ask yourselves whether those who lay claim to ordinary civilization know any more about what happens here than then did the Romans about what was happening in the catacombs. We can no longer speak so precisely. The situation has become more intellectual, but it also remains the same. If we look forward a few hundred years in our thinking, we may indulge the courageous hope that this picture will change. And, of course, those who are as ignorant of anthroposophy as the Romans were about Christianity will find this to be a fantasy. But you cannot work actively in the world if you are unable to look courageously at the path before you. And anthroposophists gladly look with such courage at the path ahead. <clears throat> this is why such pictures arise in the mind's eye. Occasionally we must look at the various opinions about anthroposophy. It has gradually come about that hardly a week goes by without the publication of some antagonistic book on anthroposophy. Opponents seem to take anthroposophy very seriously. They refute it almost every week, not so much from the perspective different not so much from the perspective different views, because they are not that inventive, but they do deny it. It is interesting to see how anthroposophy is dealt with in this way. <clears throat> we discover that otherwise very educated people, or those who should have some sense of responsibility, write books on some subject and introduce what they have read about anthroposophy. Often they have not read a single book by an anthroposophic author, but gather information from the works of opponents. Consider this example. At one time there were Gnostics, of which little remains except the Pistis Sophia, a writing that contains very little and is very difficult to understand. Today there are those who write about the Gnostics, it seems very popular, and though they know very little about it, they consider themselves its exponents. They think it is correct to say that Gnosticism arose from Greek culture. I often wonder what it would be like if anthroposophy were treated this way, if, as many frequently wish, all its spiritual scientific writings were lost to fire. Anthroposophy would become known just as the Gnostics are known today. It is interesting that people often say that anthroposophy is just warmed over Gnosticism. They do not understand anthroposophy because they have no wish to know it, and they do not know the Gnostics because no physical documentation exists. Footnote, the Nag Hammadi texts, or so-called Gnostic Gospels, were discovered in Egypt more than twenty years after these lectures. The so-called Dead Sea Scrolls, also thought to have connections with the Gnostics, were discovered in eleven caves near Qumran and the Dead Sea, Dead sea beginning around 1947. End of footnote. Nevertheless, this is how people talk. It is negative, but indicates a particular problem. Courage and strength will be needed to prevent anthroposophy going the way of Gnosticism. It must be developed so that it manifests its intrinsic reality. If we truly face such matters, we are deeply satisfied by the various endeavors that arise, which this conference exemplifies. Such initiative taken together should ensure that anthroposophy will continue to work powerfully in the future. <clears throat> in this educational course, anthroposophy has peeked in through little windows. Much has been suggested, however, and this may show how anthroposophy goes hand in hand with reality, penetrating right into everyday life. And because everything real is imbued with spirit, we cannot know and understand reality unless we have an eye for the spirit. E.Y.E. <clears throat> of course, it was impossible to speak here about anthroposophy itself. On the other hand, it was quite possible to speak of an area of activity where anthroposophy can work fruitfully in education. In the case of Eurythmy, for example, it was destiny that spoke. Today, looking at things from outside, it might be imagined that someone was struck by the sudden thought that we need eurythmy, but this was not the case. At the time, the father of a family had died. There were several children, and the mother was concerned about them. She was anxious that something worthwhile should come of them. 
The anthroposophic movement was still small. I was asked, quote, what could develop from those children, unquote. It was this question that led to the first steps toward eurythmy. Our first attempts were narrowly limited, but from these circumstances, the first suggestions for eurythmy were given. Destiny had spoken, and it manifested because anthroposophy exists, and someone standing on anthroposophic ground was seeking her calling. Soon, it did not take long, the first students of Eurythmy became teachers and were able to carry Eurythmy into the world. So, with the help of Marie Steiner, who took it under her wing, Eurythmy became what it is today. In such a case, we might not feel that Eurythmy has been sought, but rather that Eurythmy sought out anthroposophy. Now consider medicine. Dr. Ita Wegmann has been a member of the Anthroposophical Society since the beginning. Her first attempts to heal through artistic perception gave her a predisposition to work medically in the anthroposophic movement. As a devoted anthroposophist, she has dedicated herself to medicine, which has also grown from the being of anthroposophy. Today it remains firmly within it, because it grew through a particular person. <clears throat> Once the waves of the world war subsided, people's thoughts turned in every direction. But eventually something great must happen. Because people have suffered so much, they need to find the courage to accomplish something great, a complete change of heart. Great ideals were the order of the day. Authors of all stripes who might have written on other subjects wrote about such matters as the future of the state or society. Everywhere thoughts turned to what could now raise, excuse me, to what could now arise through human efforts. Out of the soil of spiritual science many things sprang up and then faded away. In the realm of education there was little to show until now. My little book, The Education of the Child, appeared more or less at the beginning of the anthroposophic movement. It contained many suggestions that could be developed into a whole system of education, but it was not considered special, merely a booklet that might help mothers raise their children. I was always asked whether a child should be dressed, say, in blue or in red. Should this child be given a yellow bed cover or that child a red one? I was asked what a child should eat and so on. This was admirable in terms of education but it did not amount, amount to much. <laughs> then in Stuttgart, out of all these confused ideals, Emil Moltz's idea emerged to establish a school for the children of the workers at the Waldorf Astoria cigarette factory. And Emil Moltz, who is here today, had the idea of giving me the responsibility for directing the school. This was a foregone conclusion destiny would not have allowed otherwise. The school was established with a hundred and fifty children of the factory workers and staffed by teachers drawn from the anthroposophic movement. Württemberg school regulations allowed us to choose men and women we deemed suitable to teach. The only condition was that the prospective teachers should be able to prove in a general way that they were su suited to the task. All this happened before the great freeing of humanity that occurred through the Weimar National Assembly. After that we would never have been able to proceed so freely. As it was, we were able to begin, and it will be possible at least for a few years to maintain the lower classes also. <clears throat> footnote, a state law might prevent children from entering the school before the fifth grade. End footnote. Anthroposophy took over the school, or perhaps the school took over anthroposophy. In a few years the school grew and children were coming from diverse backgrounds and classes. All kinds of people wanted their children to attend the Waldorf school, regardless of whether they were anthroposophists. Very strange opinions arose. Of course, parents are fondest of their own children and want them to attend an excellent school. For example, there are many opponents whose hostility is based on science. They know that anthroposophy is merely a collection of foolish and unscientific rubbish. Nevertheless, they are willing to send their children to a Waldorf school. They even realize that Waldorf education suits their children very well. <clears throat> Recently, two such people visited the school and said, quote, This Waldorf school is really good. We can see this in our children. But what a pity that it's based on anthroposophy. Unquote. Of course, the school would not have come about at all if not for anthroposophy. As you can see, the judgment of many people amounts to saying, There is an excellent dancer. It's a pity he has to stand on two legs. This is the logic of our opponents. We can only say that the Waldorf school is good. Nothing in the school is planned so that it promotes any particular world view. In terms of religious instruction, the Catholic children are taught by a Catholic priest, the evangelical children by an evangelical minister. And because there are so many in Germany who belong to no religious community, we had to arrange for a free religion class. 
otherwise those children would have had no religious teaching at all. I find it difficult to find teachers for the free religion lessons because the classes are so full. We never try to persuade children to attend since we want to be a modern school. We simply hope to have practical and fundamental principles for instruction. Nor do we have any desire to introduce anthroposophy to the school because we are not a sect. We are concerned only with matters that are universally human. Nevertheless, we cannot prevent children from leaving the evangelical or Catholic religion lessons and attending the free religion lesson. We cannot be blamed if they come, but we are responsible for making sure that the free religion lessons continue. <clears throat> little by little the Waldorf School is growing. There are now about 800 children and between 40 and 50 teachers. Its growth is well in hand, but not its finances. The financial situation is precarious. Less than six weeks ago there was no way of knowing whether the financial situation would allow the school to continue beyond mid-June. This example shows clearly how difficult it is today for such an endeavor to hold its own in the face of the miserable economic conditions of Central Europe, even when it has proved beyond all doubt the spiritual justification for its existence. Every month we experience tremendous anxiety over how to make the Waldorf School economically feasible. Destiny allows us to work but the sword of Damocles, financial need, is always hanging over our heads. As a matter of principle, we must continue to work as though the school were an external establishment. This requires a very devoted teaching staff who work with inner intensity, never knowing whether they will still be employed in three months. In any case, anthroposophic education grew out of the anthroposophical society. The least sought after prospers best. In other words, what the gods have given, not what we have made, receives the greatest blessing and good fortune. It is quite possible that the art of education must lie especially close to the hearts of anthroposophists. After all, what is truly the most inwardly beautiful thing in the world? Surely it is a growing, developing human being. To see human beings come from spirit worlds and the physical world through birth, to see what lives in them, what they brought down in definite form, to gradually become defined as their features and movements, to see properly the divine forces and manifestations working through the human form into the physical world. All this has something that in the deepest sense we might call religious. No wonder, then, that wherever there are efforts toward the purest, truest, and most intimate humanity, and where these exist as the very basis of everything anthroposophic, we can contemplate the mystery of the growing human being with sacred, religious feeling that evokes all the work we are capable of. Arising from the soul's deepest impulses, this evokes real enthusiasm for the art of education within the anthroposophic movement. We can truly say that the art of education exists in the movement as a creation that can be nurtured only through love, and this is how we nurture it. It is indeed nurtured with the utmost devoted love. Many go so far as to say that the Waldorf School is taken to heart by all who know it, and what thrives there, is do there does so in a way that must be viewed as inner necessity. <clears throat> I would like to mention two facts in this connection. Recently, a conference of the Anthroposophical Society was held in Stuttgart. During that conference, a variety of wishes were presented from very different sides. There were proposals about what might be done in different areas of work, and like today, others in the world are very clever, so of course Anthroposophists are clever too, they frequently take part in the world's clever ways. So it happened that a number of suggestions were stated, and one was particularly interesting. It was a suggestion from students in the top class of the Waldorf School, a real appeal to the Anthroposophical Society. It was signed by all the students of class 12 and went more or less as follows. We are being educated in the Waldorf School in a genuine and human way. We dread having to enter an ordinary university or college. Would it be possible for the Anthroposophical Society to create an Anthroposophic University? We would like to enter a university in which our education could be as natural and human as it is in the Waldorf School. This suggestion presented to the meeting and it stirred. Let me say that again. This suggestion was presented to the me meeting and it stirred the members' idealism. As a result, it was decided to begin an anthroposophic university. A considerable sum of money was collected, but then, because of the inflation that occurred, millions of marks simply melted into pennies. 
Nevertheless, there were those who believed it might be possible to do something of the kind before the Anthroposophical Society had become strong enough to form and give out judgments. Well, we might be able to train doctors, theologians, and so on, but what would they be able to do after their training? <clears throat> they would not be recognized. Despite this, what was felt by these childlike hearts provides an interesting testimony to the inner necessity of such education. It was certainly not unnatural that such a suggestion was presented. To continue the story, when our students entered the top class for the first time, we had to do something. We had been able to focus on giving the children a living culture, but now they would have to find a way into the dead culture essential to a college entrance exam. We had to schedule the top class so that the students could pass their test. <clears throat> this cut across our own curriculum, and in our teachers' meetings we found it difficult to limit ourselves to focusing on the examination during the final class year. Nevertheless, this is what we did. I did not find it easy when I visited the class. On the one hand, the students were yawning because they had to learn what they would have to know for the examination. On the other hand, their teachers often wanted to fit in other subjects that were not required for the examination, but were things that the students wanted to know. They always had to be reminded that they should not say one thing or another at the examination. This was a real difficulty. And then came the examination. The results were satisfactory, but in the College of Teachers and Teachers' Meetings we were completely fed up. We knew that we had already established the Walder School, but now, when we should crown our work during the last school year, we could not carry out our intentions and do what the school requires of us. And so, there and then, despite everything, we resolved to carry through the curriculum strictly to the end of the final school year, to the end of the twelfth class, and moreover to suggest to the parents and students that we should add another year, so that the examination could be taken then. The pupils were very willing to do this because they saw it as a way to realize the true intention of the Waldorf School. We experienced no opposition whatever. There was only one request, that teachers do the coaching for the exam. You see how difficult it is in today's quote-unquote reality to establish something that originates purely from knowledge of the human being. Only those who live in a fantasy world would fail to see that we had to deal with things as they are and that this leads to great difficulties. <clears throat> On the one hand, we have the art of education in the anthroposophic movement, which is loved as a matter of course. On the other, we have to recognize that the anthroposophic movement, as it exists in today's society, faces formidable difficulties when it tries to do what it considers an inner necessity, especially in the area of education. We must look reality in the face in a way that is truly alive. Do not think that I would ever ridicule those who believe things really aren't so bad or that we make too much of it all, especially since other schools get along all right. That's not the point. I know very well how much effort and spirit can be found in today's schools. I fully recognize this. But unfortunately, people no longer look forward in their thinking. They do not see the threads that connect education as it has developed in the last few centuries and what approaches us with the violence of a storm, threatening to ravage and lay our society to waste. Anthroposophy knows the conditions that are essential to developing culture in the future. This alone compels us to develop the methods you find in our education. Our concern is to provide humanity with the possibility of progress and save it from regressing. On the one hand, <clears throat> I have described how the art of education stands within the anthroposophical movement. But because this art of education is centered in the anthroposophic movement, the movement is itself faced with great difficulties in the public life of today. So with an ever-increasing group of people coming together, as it happens, and wanting to hear what anthroposophy has to say on the subject of education, we are thankful to the genius of our time that we are able to speak about what lies so close to our hearts. In this particular course of lectures, I was able to give only a sim stimulus and make certain suggestions, but when it comes right down to it, we really haven't accomplished all that much. Our anthroposophic education is based on the actual practice of teaching. It, li it lives only when it is done, because its purpose is nothing more nor less than life itself. In fact, it cannot really be described at all, but must be experienced. This is why, when we try to stimulate interest in what must enter life, we must use we must make use of every possible art of speech to show how those who practice the anthroposophical art of education strive to work from the fullness of life. 
Perhaps I have succeeded only poorly in this course, but I tried. And so you see how our education has grown out of anthroposophy in accordance with destiny. Many people still live with anthroposophy and want it only as a world view for heart and soul, and they look with suspicion at anthroposophy when it broadens its area of activity to include art, medicine, education, and so on. But it cannot do otherwise, since anthroposophy requires life. It must work out of life, and it must work into life. Perhaps these lectures on the art of education have succeeded to some extent in showing that anthroposophy is in no way sectarian or woven from fantasy, but intended to face the world with the cool reason of mathematics, although as soon as we enter the spiritual, mathematical coolness engenders enthusiasm, since the word enthusiasm itself is connected with spirit and we cannot help becoming enthusiastic even if we are cool in the mathematical sense when we speak and act out of the spirit. Even if anthroposophy is still seen today as an absurd fantasy, it will gradually dawn on people that it is based on absolutely concrete foundations and that it strives in the widest sense to embody and practice life. And maybe this can be demonstrated best of all today in the area of education. If I have been able to come if I have been able to give some of you a, f a few stimulating ideas, then I am satisfied. Our work together will be best served if those who have been stirred and stimulated a little can, through common effort, find a way to continue in life what these lectures were intended to inspire. <laughs>